allegations against the president, uh, his administration, and his family. Welcome, everybody. I'm Neil Kudo. And on your world today, a startling development. Uh, the bloom is off the rose between the president of the United States and his once top campaign advisor, who played a critical role in the president's inauguration very close to a year ago. That was then. Very different relationship now. In fact, no relationship at all now. Fox News Channel's Kevin Cork at the White House with what went wrong and how fast it went wrong. Kevin. Boy, did it go fast, and boy, did it go wrong. Let me tell you, Neil, it's one of those unusual days, right? We talk about this on occasion. Sometimes you have a little falling out. Sometimes you have a difference of opinion. But what we have here today at the White House in Washington is quite the separation. We're talking about a clash of titans here, uh, in, in part because of what was said in that book that you talked about, the president uh, pushing back very strongly on some suggestions made by his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who you may recall the president previously has called a friend. And, and Time magazine, uh, interestingly, uh, actually once uh, referred to him as the great manipulator. Now, let me just share part uh, of what is in this book today as uh, recorded uh, by uh, Michael Wolf, the author, uh, and he's, uh, he's quoting Steve Bannon as having said some pretty explosive things, uh, in particular about the meeting uh, back at Trump Tower uh, during the 2016 election. And some of the things that he is saying are eyebrow-raising, to say the least. Let me just share part of what we have here. In the excerpts from this book, Bannon describing that meeting between the president's son and a group of Russians during the uh, campaign as, quote, treasonous and unpatriotic, treasonous and unpatriotic. He said he believed that the Russians were then, after the meeting, taken up to see President or then candidate Trump. That's something, by the way, the president has repeatedly denied. Said Bannon, the chance that Don Jr. didn't walk these jumos up to his father's office on the 26th floor is zero. And if you don't know what the expression jumos mean, it's sort of a pejorative. It, it sort of means that you're drunk or that you drink a lot. Uh, as for the Russia probe, it was interesting. Uh, Bannon seemed to surmise, uh, Neil, that the special counsel, Bob Mueller, was really trying to angle toward uh, money laundering of some of the Trump acolytes as a way ultimately to ensnare uh, the president. Uh, and this is something else that Bannon said. I want to take it to this uh, full screen. It says, uh, they're going to crack Don Jr. like an egg on national TV. Yeah, you better believe the president was not liking any of this. He's pushing back very forcefully. Again, some of the statements that uh, he is uh, making today are strong, very strong. He said this, Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. I don't think it does anything to the president's base. The, the, the base and the people that supported this president supported the president and supported his agenda. Those things haven't changed. The president's still exactly who he was uh, yesterday as he was two years ago when he started out on the campaign trail. His agenda hasn't changed, and he's continuing to fight for and push for that agenda. And I think the base is extremely excited and happy with the job that this president has done in his first year in office. Look at all he's accomplished. I think they're pretty happy with where he is. Sarah Sanders, the uh, White House press secretary, not long ago. Now, you may recall, my friend, uh, shortly after firing Bannon, the president uh, uh, was obviously trying to say the right things about Bannon. Bannon, meanwhile, said this to the Weekly Standard, the Trump presidency that we fought for and won is over. You get the sense that Bannon was suggesting that the Trump White House simply wasn't going far enough to reach its potential to reshape conservative American politics. Now, the president, for his part, uh, noted that, look, this guy didn't come onto the campaign until after I'd already knocked out 17 competitors in the primaries. And so now he is labeling him as a self-inflated man who not only lost his job, Neil, but lost his mind. Now, you and I have talked about a lot of different things in our many years together. This is one day we will remember as one of the more unusual, to say the least. And I've never said you've lost your mind. Uh, but <laughs> you, know, <yet. laughs> you know what's so weird about it, though, buddy? I was looking at it. Uh, Bannon left the White House, was forced to resign uh, in the middle of August, uh, there around there. Yep. And in that time, right. put together this book that's already out now, which is probably going to lead some to believe he was writing it as he was there. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, Sarah Sanders, the press secretary, said something interesting. Uh, Michael Wolff's actually been here a number of times, about a dozen times, according to uh, uh, the press secretary. Uh, the vast majority, she said 95% of those visits uh, were at the behest of uh, Steve Bannon. Hmm. But it's also interesting, some of the things that you sort of hear behind the scenes are, what about others who have since left uh, Team Trump? 
you know, maybe an Omarosa, for example. I'm not saying she did, but you're, you, you hear people say things like, what if an Omarosa, what if a this person or what if a that person might have had a conversation with him as well. There are plenty of people out there with an axe to grind or maybe with a perspective that might not line up with uh, what the president's team believes, but that's what books are for, and it looks like they're going to sell plenty of them, my friend. I think that, uh, that's an understatement. Kevin, thank you very much. Kevin Cork. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to Real Clear Politics. Caitlin Ewey Burns. Uh, Caitlin, obviously, uh, as I said at the outset, the bloom is off that rose. If there ever was one, maybe mm -hmm. around a year ago, ahead of the president's inaugural address, shaped in large part, we are told, maybe it's wrong, by Steve mm -hmm. Bannon, things have changed. What happened? Certainly things have changed and this creates all sorts of problems for the president, not only on the political campaign front. Remember, uh, Bannon is actively involved in several Senate primaries heading into this election year. Uh, and on the uh, on the other side, too, the comments that he's been making about Donald Trump Jr., about Jared Kushner, as it pertains to the Russia investigation, an investigation the president has tried to undermine and has called a witch hunt, uh, Bannon is creating more information, so to speak, to put in front of the Mueller probe, possibly, and uh, those congressional investigations. So this is uh, going to create some some issues for the Trump campaign and I, uh, for the Trump pre presidency, and I think that's why you see the president fighting back so hard on that today. You know, that statement that was released, uh, it was so different and not like the, the, the mm -hmm. typical kind of terse tweets that the president releases. What did you make of that, uh, whether he was behind it, whether this was carefully crafted by several mm -hmm. people? What, what do you think? Right. Well, because of the comments that Steve Bannon made about his children, we know the president is very protective of that. And of course, uh, as it pertains to that broader Russia probe, you can see a reason why uh, the White House wanted to push back on that. And also because of uh, the problems that this could create moving forward. I think it is significant that the president came out with that fierce statement today. But, um, you know, he did continue to talk to Bannon frequently after he left, after Bannon left the White House. Sarah Sanders saying today their last conversation was just last month. S continued to seek advice and counsel from Steve Bannon. But, um, you know, I think you might also see some Republicans be very excited uh, about the president fighting back against Steve Bannon. Remember, that's something that they want the president to do, especially as it pertains to all these really tough races uh, on the congressional side they'll have next year, this year. Incredible. Uh, Caitlin Huey Burns, good seeing you again. You too. Thanks. All right, I want to show you something. I want you to take a guess where this is. All right, you think it's Hampshire, Maine, New York? Try Charleston, South Carolina, an Arctic blast in the deep south. And it's coming to a, a town near you. in the deep south and it's coming to a, a town near you all right it's a deep freeze you know that but here's the difference it's gripping much of the nation two-thirds of it down to the south niagara falls is looking more like a winter wonderland we got rivers frozen over in chicago Ice flowing along the mighty Mississippi. You got icy roads and worse in Galveston, Texas. And in Charleston, South Carolina, you got snow. Stuff that they never see. And in Tallahassee, they've seen it. Now they're seeing it. And a lot of them are telling me they don't like it. Some of its water parks, including, I might point out, something called Blizzard Beach. But the worst could be on the way. Something called a bomb cyclone that's taking shape off the east coast now it could bring the coldest temperatures we've seen in a hundred years more on that in a moment to jeff flock who was there a hundred years ago covering this very storm that was then he's back with us now he's maintained his youth in a snazzy coat as well what's it like there buddy feels like uh, i've been here about a hundred years and uh, there you go we are in the coldest spot in chicago at least that's what some people say this is this is a michigan avenue bridge look at the wind blowing the wind blows down the canyon of the river with all these big buildings you see the big buildings there one of them actually named after the president and everything wind blows down here makes this the coldest spot in the city with the wind chill uh you know we've been in this neil and i know some people say well 
We've got snow in Florida. That's a bigger story than cold in Chicago. But the truth is, that guy's got a eight pack or twelve pack of beer, and that lady does not. Uh, the the truth of it is, we have been in this deep freeze now for a week. That is to say, temperatures not above twenty degrees at any time uh, whatsoever in that last week, and we're going to be through it again for the next five days. They say until what? Well, five days? Let's see. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Four days. Four more days to go. Uh, it's not pleasant wherever you are in America, I think, right now. You know, you know uh, Jeff, I meant to tell you, we always get email on you when you're on. People love you, and I'm not surprised. But I had one viewer said, you know, Neil, I My love... My mother again. Well, yes, could be, uh, because this would die with the sentiment here. I love Jeff Block much more when he's outside. Can you make sure he's covering this outside from now on through the length and course of the storm? I wrote this uh, lady, it is a lady back, Irma. Is it, you're, anyway, and I said, yes, we'll, we'll make sure that's the case. No relation. You got it? They, they love you. They Neil, love you if you would agree to come out in this, you could get one of these brand new coats. This, this is built for Alaskan dog sled racers. Really? You could get one of these coats if you come out. That's the one you stole from Phil Flynn. You were wearing it on FBN, and that's and poor little Phil's running around now in his skivvies, and he said, what the heck happened? <laughs> All right, good to see you, Jeff Locke. He'll be outside every day for the next week. Uh, I hope that wasn't just a glove he was waving back at me. All right. It is called a bomb cyclone, and it's an explosive, unusual storm that started off the East Coast, will be off the East Coast. The question is, how does it develop from there? Uh, I don't know these things, but fortunately, Joe Bastardi does, Weather Bell meteorologist. What is this thing? What does it do? Well, it's we we refer to it as cyclogenesis and bombogenesis. See, this that's is a term the term that, that I use. Go ahead. Well, it's a, the bombogenesis. We used this back uh, when I was in college. We used to talk about. It's just that meteorologists are getting bold enough to actually start uh, saying some of the stuff that uh, we would say in map discussions way back when. A, a, a prime example, believe it or not. Here we go, Neil. November 11th, 1968. The deepening of a storm up the East Coast, 40 millibars, the pressure fell that much in a total of eight hours. And much of the New Jersey coast, for instance, with that bomb of Genesis, was raked by uh, hurricane force winds with two feet of snow back into Pennsylvania. So what happens is, again, I try to put it into perspective. What you're seeing is the weather, yes, going to extremes, but it is going to an extreme that is expected given the overall pattern. And that pattern has been a step down to frigid cold, and this is something we've been outlining since October. We simply took the hurricane seasons, the global hurricane season, tropical seasons of 33, 1950, 1995, 2005, 2010, all those Decembers turned out wickedly cold in the eastern part of the United States and then got warmer in January, which is a good sign down the road. Okay, I, I didn't understand so, so what you what said, but is, I, I think what you're saying is that this is a big deal, right? It's a, it's a big deal, Neil. It's a blip. There's going to be blizzard conditions from, uh, from Virginia Beach all the way up, I think, through the city. I think the city's getting six, eight inches of snow. It's going to be whipped around by 50 mile an hour winds with temperatures in the teens tomorrow afternoon. The blizzard warnings into Long Island, southeastern New England. This is a crushing storm. Is one to two feet of snow. Providence, Boston, back toward uh, uh, New Haven. One to two. Feet. Did you say one to two feet wind. of snow in in Boston? Two, in that yeah, area? It, yeah, they're going to get hammered out there. Wow. And look. It's not as bad. D.C., we got one to three. Philadelphia, four to eight locally, locally up to 10. New York, uh, this is what my company has, six to 12. But once you get further northeast, this is an out-and-out blizzard. It's a 12-hour thumping event where it comes through, comes very, very hard. The wind blows strongest, folks, during the middle and latter part of the storm. And then wickedly cold air comes in, the coldest air of the season for the northeastern part of the United States over this fresh uh, uh, fresh snow cover, we call it a direct discharge of cold air. That means that instead of monkeying around out in the Midwest, this air comes straight down out of the north, and New York City on Saturday may not get out of the single digits for highs, could fall as low as five below uh, Saturday night. That's how cold this air mass is. Holy cow. All right, Joe Bastardi, uh, you are the bomb, young man, uh, the bomb cycle. Hey, Thank you very you know, much. Yes. Before you go, thaw coming mid and late January, so get ready. A thaw is coming then? A thaw is coming, and, it's, and that's why Jan people talk about January thaws, 
because old time winners, this is an old fashioned winter. They noticed that would happen. You're going to see it happen mid and late January. Much of the country will be well above normal and then it will come back in February. Okay. Well, I can live with that. That's something to look forward to. All right. Okay. Holy Toledo. All right. Thank you, my friend. Uh, you know, look at stocks today. If, if we're heading for, you know, a, a snowstorm and all this other stuff, it was snowing by orders at the corner of Wall and Broad. See how I worked that beam in there? Nothing flaky about what's going on at the corner of Wall and Broad. Nothing at all, America. Basic cable, free for you. More after this. All right, uh, the Dow finished up close to uh, 100 points today. Uh, that is good enough for a record, and we're not too far from 25,000. Talk about a quick sprint ahead now to the next 1,000-point level. Uh, this would be the seventh one since uh, Donald Trump was elected, the sixth of his presidency uh, that took shape on January 20th of last year, so we're about a year uh, into that now. Uh, but a lot of things we're focusing on is this meeting that wrapped up, a bipartisan meeting of congressional leadership that included the likes of Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer, uh, Speaker Paul Ryan, I believe, in his office uh, with Mitch McConnell. Uh, they're going to come out of there. And uh, tripods are not required for these things. So we, we generally just go with the flow. So when they come out there... <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, people are working hard, and who am I to kid? Mike Emanuel has got the latest on what might have happened at this powwow. What are you hearing, buddy? Well, Neil, good afternoon to you. All indications are these budget talks are very serious between White House officials and the top four congressional leaders. The key players have saved much of their talking for behind closed doors so far. You have the White House Legislative Affairs Director Mark Short and the Budget Director Mick Mulvaney up here on Capitol Hill seeking a two-year budget agreement. Sources suggest a deal could be reached by raising the current spending caps by $200 billion over the next two years. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's priority is more money for the military. It is vital that our agreement provide sufficient resources for our all-volunteer armed forces. Under the Budget Control Act, America's military has been stretched thin by disproportionate cuts that have harmed our combat readiness. There are two new Democrat senators on Capitol Hill starting this new year with the swearing-in of Doug Jones of Alabama and Tina Smith of Minnesota. The addition of Jones cuts into the GOP majority. It's now down to 51-49, and Democrats are starting the new year pushing for their priorities. We can start on the budget with opioids, veterans' health care and pensions, with children's health insurance and disaster aid. And we can resolve the fate of the dreamers and say to these hardworking kids that America has a place for them, too. There is certainly ca uh, calendar pressure here on Capitol Hill with lawmakers in the White House facing a late night January 19th deadline to come up with another funding agreement. Neil. Now, let's see if they can do that. All right. Thank you, buddy, very much. Mike Emanuel. All thank right. You, so January 19th, that's a do or die day. Will they get that uh, done? Because uh, so much hinges on it, maybe including this ongoing market rally. Uh, let's get the read uh, from Ron DeSantis, the House Judiciary Committee member. By the way, this is a big subject that we're going to have when we're live in Washington for our kickoff live show uh, on the 20th, uh, Saturday. Uh, Congress, good to have you. Uh, how likely is it, do you think, that this is, is done uh, and, and there is no budget busting fears, so no shutdown fears. Well, it's hard to say at this point, but I would just point out, Neil, the House has already passed all appropriations bills. Uh, that was done on time for the first time in years. It's really a matter of what the U.S. Senate is able to get through, as we've seen time and time again over the last year. Uh, my view would be, you know, we believe in what the Leader McConnell said about fortifying the military. They should push forward with that and make Schumer stand up and filibuster it. I don't think they have the gumption to sustain a filibuster, but if we just give them a gusher of new spending on welfare and things that we don't believe in and aren't good for the taxpayer, um, I think that the goodwill we earn with the tax bill, I think some of that's going to dissipate. And I actually think it'll be worse for the economy if we go on a spending spree rather than actually try to be fiscally responsible. You know, Congressman, I was mentioning before that we're going to be down in your neck of the woods there, and it probably will be a very chilly neck of the woods on the 20th, the one-year anniversary of the president's inauguration, and just a day after this deadline. So is there a sense of Republicans trying to unite, not necessarily with the same degree of gravitas with the tax cut thing, but so that on the anniversary of his inauguration, we're not looking at a shutdown? 
There may be. I mean, we're going to go back uh, to Washington in the House on January 8th, and I think that we'll have the temperature take. I, I think that the House majority is fine. We'll be able to handle it. I think the question is, is who runs the Senate? And if Schumer is going to call the shots, that and makes it a little Democratic bit more difficult. And you need votes in the Senate. People fail to understand that they, you're, it's not sort of like a squeaker with the tax cut vote, just Republicans. You're going to need Democrats there, right? Do you think they, well, are, they you, are there? Well, you... You, you might. I mean, you know, here's the thing, Neil. I mean, Schumer will threaten to filibuster. He doesn't actually filibuster. It's kind of like, OK, we can't have a filibuster. I think it would be suicidal politically for Schumer to filibuster a spending bill that pays our troops and fortifies our defenses because he wants more money for some of the Democratic welfare priorities. Um, I don't think he actually could sustain that. So you need 60 if you think he can sustain a filibuster. I've questioned that all year, but he's yeah. never been put to the test. You know, I'd be remiss. You're on the Judiciary Committee and the House and that there's been investigations ongoing that Steve Bannon in this latest dust up seems to hint at a book are going to be a problem for the administration, certainly a problem for the president's son, Donald Jr., and of course for his son-in-law, uh, Jared Kushner. Is it your sense that all this dust up and the two now seem to hate each other, uh, is there something there that the president should worry about? Well, I was surprised to read those comments. I mean, you know, that, that Trump Jr. meeting, I thought, was blown way out of proportion uh, by the media and, well, and, and by Bannon's the Democrats. Well, now the one blowing it out here. What the heck is no, that No, I know. That's, that, yeah. that's, well, that's why I said I'm surprised to hear that. Um, and I don't think that that's, a, that's an accurate thing. Of course, that was before Steve was on the campaign. Right. So we'll have to see. I haven't seen Steve make any comments. I don't know whether those are accurate quotes or not. I mean, there were certain things in that book that I saw reported where someone had suggested former Speaker Boehner for a position, and they claimed that that President-elect Trump said, I don't know who John Boehner is. He's known Boehner for years. I mean, they've golfed together. So some of this stuff I don't think has credibility, and we'll, we'll see uh, you know, how it all shakes out. But I think the, the issue with the, the Russia thing is from the very beginning with Rosenstein, he did not impose any limits on the subject matter or on the duration of the investigation. I don't think there's evidence of any type of criminal conspiracy involving the Russian government and the Trump campaign, uh, but it seems like Mueller is able to look for other things beyond that, and I don't think that's the way this stuff's supposed to operate. You think Bannon turned on the president? It's possible. I mean, you know, I don't know what the circumstances were when Steve left the White House. Um, and so, you know, you never know. But I also no. think that there are, there are journalists who will write some of this stuff and maybe embellish it because it will absolutely sell more books uh, the more outlandish the comments are. Congressman, thanks for your patience. All this breaking news. You handle it very ably. I appreciate it, sir. Be well. Thank you. All right, uh, calls are growing right now to sue the Golden State after California becomes the first sanctuary state. Now, uh, forget about what's legal. Is going after them for doing what they're doing legal? All right, a stand down on that fire at, uh, that was reported earlier on at the uh, Clinton home in Chappaqua, New York. The report is wrong. We're hearing a small fire broke out at a Secret Service facility today near the property, a building not connected to their home. Everyone's okay. Relax. We got to work with the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice needs to do a couple things. Number one, they need to they need to file charges against the sanctuary cities. Number two, they need to hold back their funding. Another thing they need to do, they need to hold these these politicians personally accountable. I mean, more citizens are going to die because of these policies, and these politicians can't make these decisions and be held unaccountable for people dying. I mean, we we need to hold these politicians accountable for their actions. All right, so what does that mean? Hold them accountable. When I was raising it with the uh, acting ICE director, the question came up, how do you force the issue if states are doing something you deem to think is illegal, and a lot of uh, legal experts tell me it is, can you sue them or worse, go after them? Let's ask a pretty bright lawyer in her own right, and she's the host of the hit Fox News at night, Shannon Bream. Shannon, legally, what can ICE do? Well, Neil, you know that made a lot of news, that interview that you had yesterday upset a lot of folks on the left, including the ACLU. They are calling the director's comments outrageous. They say it was about ratcheting up intimidation tactics and that there's no valid basis that state or local officials could be prosecuted for carrying out these so-called sanctuary policies. Meanwhile, a Republican candidate for governor governor out in California is calling on the president and the attorney general, Jeff Sessions, to do just that. He says it's time for them to sue California over the new sanctuary state policy.
State Assemblyman Travis Allen says that a showdown is definitely coming. He says the president and attorney general should call California's bluff. So he says, yeah, go ahead and sue. Now, this new law largely bans state and local law enforcement officials from using personnel or resources to hold, question, or share information about people with federal immigration agents unless they've been convicted of a very specific crime. There's a list. If it's not on that list, they won't turn over the information. Well, the state's attorney general, former Democrat Congressman Javier Becerra, he says, bring it on. He's says the law is constitutional. He stands ready to defend it. And Neil, he thinks he'd win. You know, you're a great lawyer. I'm not. So, Shannon, I'm wondering the actions that California has taken as the first state to do this. Other cities and towns have done so across the country. But a state is implementing a policy that protects people who technically shouldn't be here because uh, they're not legal. And, and And we're providing legal rights for them uh, and shielding them from federal authorities, even though they're not legal. So the ICE uh, acting director is saying, well, we have every every uh, opportunity here to make good on our authority. And mm -hmm. uh, that could be a whole legal mess. It could be. And you know that the administration has already been challenged over its attempts to defund or withhold funding from a number of sanctuary cities uh, that wouldn't comply. You know, they were going to hold back some funding with DOJ. grants and some right. other things. Some of that has been shut down. The courts have told them, listen, you got to do it. You got to move ahead. Now, a lot of those decisions are coming from places within the Ninth Circuit, and we know that tends to be liberal, and they're going to tend to agree with these so-called sanctuary cities and states. So, listen, nothing ca you know bars them from instituting a lawsuit, but honestly, the Supreme Court has not weighed in on this. Uh, a battle could be started. It's uh, very probable. I mean, the attorney general, Jeff Sessions, has called this bill out in California unconscionable. So he sounds like he'd be interested in, in probing into it. And a number of people are calling on him to do just that. So we'd see if it would go all the way to the Supreme Court. They alone would probably be the ones that would have to settle this question. You're not here uh, legally. You're not a citizen of this country legally. You are being shielded by authorities who know they are shielding those who are not here legally or U.S. citizens. Just that would see if it would go all the way to the Supreme Court. They alone would probably be the ones that would have to settle this question. You're not here uh, legally. You're not a citizen of this country legally. You are being shielded by authorities who know they are shielding those who are not here legally or U.S. citizens. It would seem at face value to to be a stretch. And oddly, it's going to be the acting ICE director who could be stepping into tricky legal waters trying to address it. Yeah, because, you know, if you look at the language of these federal detainers, these so-called the paperwork that the feds will send in, that they want the state or local uh, facilities to cooperate with them, somebody they want turned over, um, the language there doesn't say that the states and localities absolutely are required by law and have to do it. Um, but then you get into this back and forth, this kind of gray area where the feds say, OK, you don't have to do it, but then we're going to withhold money. Because if you're not complying with what we think is in the best interest of protecting this country, which is what the president's duty is, um, they feel there's enough legal ground for them to go after this. And by the way, a number of sheriffs all across California say they're in a really tough st uh, spot here. Many of them had openly opposed all or parts of this bill because they're the ones in California. They oversee the jails all across the state. So they have control over who gets access to the citizen status, uh, citizenship status of hundreds of thousands of people who pass through their facilities. They say they're not anti-immigrant, they're anti-crime. And that's how they want to be able to act. They're worried now they're going to get sued by one side or the other based on what they do. Incredible. Um, Shannon Bream, thank you. I actually understand that now, thanks to you. Good. Uh, Shannon Bream, see you tonight at 11. See All right, in the meantime, you think it's cold right now outside? Nothing compared to what's in store for Camp David this weekend. The powwow you don't know about that could prove the ill chill will of a lifetime after this. You know, they say if you're going to make a resolution, kind of lower the expectations, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself, and then you'll surprise on the upside. A lot of people build careers out of that. A big meeting with the president this weekend, a lot of leadership coming up with ideas to get an agenda in line, but there's a lot of things they don't even want to try to do, so they're lowballing it and going to lowball it for the president of the United States. How's that going to work out? 
Let's ask Fox News senior Capitol Hill producer Chad Pergram. How's this meeting going to go? Explain who's going to be there, what's happening. Well, President Trump will meet with Republican congressional leaders from the House and the Senate at Camp David. Uh, this is a big meeting. We've just completed a meeting here, a bipartisan meeting with congressional leaders. And uh, Mark Short, the director of legislative affairs for the White House, and Mick Mulvaney, the budget director, that's just concluded the past couple of minutes. The reason that the Republican leaders might want to lower expectations, especially when President Trump is talking about infrastructure and doing big things in 2018, is they have to deal with the big stuff first. And the big stuff involves keeping the government open on uh, January 19th. They have to renew FISA, the, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Operation, domestic spying program, budget caps. That was a big part of this meeting just a few minutes ago. And Neil, don't forget that Democrats hold many of the cards. I asked the House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi as she walked uh, just behind us here a few minutes ago, did she push for DACA, a DACA fix dealing with the DREAM Act in this meeting? And she said, quote, always. Now that's something that Republican leaders don't want to address in this meeting. They want to keep those issues separate. But again, if Republicans, they have the majority in the House and the Senate, if they can fund the government on their terms on January 19th, great. If they can't, they have to look for Democratic votes. And that's why the Democratic hand is so strong right now. That's why Nancy Pelosi may be pushing for DACA. But what they have to wrap up first is a top line spending number. Remember, Republicans wanted to address defense spending. That's something that Democrats want to reduce. They want what they call some degree of parity, saying, look, if you're going to cut back on defense, we want to, you know, to, to do something on the non 